like loving writing and wanting to be a journalist and what sparked that interest from such a young age? I yeah, wanted to be a writer and a journalist from so young. It's funny, really. I found a diary once um, and it was one of those diaries that has certain entries for you to write in. It said, my name is Katie. I am age seven. When I grow up, I want to be a journalist. And I found it and thought, what, how does a seven-year-old even know what a journalist is? Why did I want to be a journalist at seven years old? I used to make um, a, a magazine for my neighbours when I was like 10, 11. So I, I, I feel like I've, I've been working since I was like 10. <laughs> <laughs> like I just never stopped working. Um, I used to do that. And when I left school, I did a, a degree in English, um, but then I did an NCTJ, which is the sort of recognised journalism qualification. I went and did that for a year after I left university. And at the time, I was sort of doing loads of voluntary work for uh, local and community radio stations. So to get that newsroom experience, I was reading the news, writing the news, doing radio shows, writing my own sort of blog, you know, just trying to get all that work experience because I knew how competitive it was. You know, all anyone ever told me was it's so competitive, it's so competitive you know you've got to work really hard um so I was doing a lot of that and then I was just desperate to work for the BBC I was applying for every job I could possibly see on the on the job site I mean I think I probably applied for the DG job at some point I didn't even know what I was applying for I just went for it and I ended up getting uh, onto a trainee scheme a production management uh, trainee scheme and I think the BBC is brilliant with all these schemes because this was one for you know people who hadn't worked in the media before to get new people in and through that, I worked for Radio 4 for a bit in radio drama. I did a few like three month, four month contracts with them. Um, and then I got a job as a PA in CBBC. So I was the PA to the controller of CBBS and the controller of CBBC. And loads of people said to me, oh, don't take a job, an admin job like that. You'll never get back into a creative job. And I thought, you know, it did worry me actually when people said that, but it was a load of rubbish. Um, so I was doing this job as a PA, which was great experience because, you know, working to two controllers, you learn so much about the BBC, how it works, the programmes, what they want. Um, you get to know all these amazing people. But at the same time, I wanted to keep the creativity going. So I was doing a radio show on a Tuesday night for a Tameside Radio in Manchester near me. And I was writing a blog. I was working myself to death, you know. Um, and then I got a job as a researcher for CBBS. And I was like, right, brilliant. This is it. This is me made. It's all I've ever wanted to do. I want to be a researcher and then a producer. And then as I got that job, my boss, Cheryl Taylor, who was the controller of CBBC and still is, said to me, have you ever thought about presenting? And I genuinely hadn't. It didn't even cross my mind that someone like me could be a presenter, you know. Um, so anyway, she sent me for the audition. Um, and I did the audition and I got the job. I think I was just cheap and available to start on Monday. <laughs> so I got the kick and then did that for six years. And it was just the best, most life-changing experience ever. Just amazing. The best thing that ever could have happened to me. Um, and through that, I got involved with a lot of mental health charities. And through my interest in mental health, I got in touch with Radio One because I loved the surgery, which was a show they did about mental health on there and said to them, I would love to come and, and, and help out with that. Gemma Kearney left and I ended up getting the gig on the surgery and then that became Life Hacks, which is the radio show I do now. So yeah, it all sort of stemmed from, from getting that gig on CBBC really. And it's all come full circle because really now I feel like my job is more journalistic. And you've kind of done then like a lot of the behind the scenes work as well. So looking back, how do you feel that all that behind the scenes work really helped your career now? I think it massively helps for lots of reasons. I think having a general understanding of how something works, how a whole production works is so important, whatever role you're in. Um, but also I think when you're a journalist in radio, especially, it's very hands-on, it's all hands on deck, you know. You all come up with ideas for the show, you all book guests and, and chat to people and think of what would be great for it. And I think the best presenters and the best journalists are all rounders like that. And I think nowadays that is almost what you are expected to be as well. What was your funniest moment on CBBC? I don't think I could even, oh, it's, CBBC is all one funny moment. Like, I don't think I've, it's quite depressing, but I don't think I have laughed since I left CBBC like I laughed on there like that kind of crying you're going to wet yourself you can't breathe sort of laughter that comes with working with Phil Fletcher and Warwick Brownlow Pike who are the two puppet dogs Hacker and Dodge you know 
just the funniest people that you'll ever meet. I've, there's a blooper reel that's on YouTube of me and Hacker. Um, and I watch it whenever I'm having a down day. And it's just hilarious. And mostly the funny bits are Hacker just completely forgetting his lines. And this is what's so amazing about live TV. And I miss it so much. You cannot be live because no matter what happens, it's just got to happen. So how do you prepare for a live broadcast then? And what would you say are the differences between live and pre-recorded? I love live because you don't really know what's going to happen. And if you make a mistake, you don't have to do it again. When you pre-record, you have to keep redoing it. So it's a bit annoying. <laughs> um, when I'm preparing for the radio, research is so important. If you're going to interview a guest, if you've got time to read their book in its entirety, brilliant. You might not have, but if you've at least got time to read what they've been up to on Twitter, on Instagram, read their Wikipedia profile, read a recent interview they've done. You know, I just think the amount, the more knowledge that you can have, the better, because it shows, I think, if you don't know something. And if you don't know it, be honest I think as well you know I, I will never say oh I've read your book it's brilliant if I haven't <laughs> because they might catch me out you know I'd hate to be caught out I think be honest so I haven't read this actually but I'm really interested in what I have heard about it and I always like to just look ahead at what is what is coming up at the show on the show in case we get a bit where we've got to fill time I like to have a little backup of what we can talk about you know oh I can talk about we've got this coming up or we've got this music coming up I think that's really important I always just like to have the most content possible for me like the beauty of radio is it like anyone can record it anywhere and obviously with the pandemic a lot of people have been working from home including you right now are you in your bedroom I'm in my spare room yeah spare room, exactly <laughs> so what has that been like like that shift from like a nice shiny studio to now like working from home yeah, it's been all right. You know, I mean, the first like weekend that we were doing Radio 1 from home, I interviewed Dua Lipa in this room, like on my laptop on Zoom. And I was like, oh, this is so weird. You know, I never thought I'd be doing Radio 1 from my spare room and chatting to Dua Lipa in her bedroom, you know. Um, and it, it's been really good. And that's the brilliance of radio that I think on TV, you have noticed it. You know, when I've watched TV, I've thought, you know what, it's much better having a guest in the studio. But on radio, you can't really tell. Most people have got a decent enough setup now on their on their computer, or even our mobile phones are, are good enough these days. Um, <laughs> she says like an old woman. And I think going forward, we'll probably continue to interview guests from their own homes because it's so much less effort you know you don't have to expect as much of someone you don't have to expect them to travel and in your work that you do with like life hacks and even writing your book dear katie i feel like you you cover quite emotional challenging and really personal topics as a presenter how do you support those conversations so those voices that are telling their stories can be heard I always um, make sure I have a good chat with someone that we're going to have on air sort of before or after, you know, especially if they're going to be talking about something like that. I'll make sure I have a little chat with them off air first, let them know what we're going to be talking about. Let them know if it's pre-recorded that if they say anything that later on they think, can we take that out? That's absolutely fine. And just try and make them feel as comfortable as possible. Um, and I suppose I'm quite open about my mental health. I mean, I talk about everything and anything on there. There's not a lot I haven't shared. Sometimes I do come away and think, God, what on earth? to say there I've been in trouble a few times you know my, I've been trouble with my mum a few times the things I've said on air so <laughs> I think I think because I am very open hopefully that means that people will be open back with me why was writing dear Katie so important to you I've suffered with anxiety and depression and I realized that it started really early that actually I was displaying symptoms of anxiety when I was a child and when I realised that, and when I was on CBBC and working with all these children's mental health charities, it just made me so passionate about early intervention and teaching children emotional skills, you know, and, and teaching them to look after their minds in the same way we teach them to look after their bodies from a really early age. So that's why it was so, so important. And also, I just always loved an Agony Ant page in a magazine. Like, that was the first thing I went to when I was a kid or a teenager, if I got Ms. Magazine or Smash Hits or, like, Cosmo when it was a little bit later, later on in my life. Like, I would just flick straight to the problem pages. I was obsessed with them. And you're so passionate, like, about young people and the sorts of things that they're kind of going through. Why do you have this passion? Like, you've spent, like, a lot of your years doing programming for young people, even, you know, CBBC and Children's, then moving on to Radio 1. Why do you have, like, this passion for young people? Why do you think their voices need to be heard? I think I've always been um, 
stuck at about 14, 15 in my head a little bit. I just really sympathise with teenagers. And I don't know whether it's because I look back at that as a particularly hard time for me. I don't think there was anything particularly going on for me that was harder than it was for everyone else. But I just think it's a hard time with bullying and with fancying people and feeling pressure to, you know, do all the things that you're supposed to do. Pressure from your peers, pressure from your teachers, pressure from your parents, pressure from society to just be this all round brilliant individual. That's the first time that all comes on you as a teenager, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just really sympathise with that time. I look back at that time and think that bits of it were really hard and they still are for young people now and they continue to be. And I also think you feel a bit unheard at that age. You're stuck between child and adult and you feel like you're sort of shouting at the adults to listen to you, but and you don't really care about the kids listening to you. And you're in, you're in this middle bit of like, what do I do and where where is my place? And actually you're a lot smarter than people perhaps think you are. So I, I just, I feel really passionate about listening to that age more. And also they're just the future. There's, there's no one more important than the kids and the teenagers. There's no one whose mental health matters more than them. And if you could go back in time and tell yourself something that you know now that you wish you knew then, what would it be? Oh, it sounds so cliche but it's cliche for a reason and it would be to be yourself and it does sound like the biggest cliche in the world but we waste we all do it we waste so much time as human beings and especially in our younger years pretending that we are into music we're not into or into hobbies we're not into or spending time with friends that don't make us feel very good or forcing ourselves down a career path that actually isn't for us and you only find true happiness and contentment when you just give up that and go right this is what I want to do and this is who I want to spend time with and this is who I am so it's the biggest cliche to tell young people to be themselves <laughs> but it's true and I don't think we all even realize that we've not been being ourselves until a certain point mm -hmm.